Hello and welcome to another episode of Late Do You Remember This? I'm of course your host Darlene and today we'll be doing a talkie episode, as I like to call them, with Troy McKeady of the podcast Dunzo. Um, he's family of the show. We all know him. We all love him. And we're going to be talking about the first episode of The Girls Next Door. And then next episode, we will be continuing with the storytelling series. We'll be doing part two, where we will talk about Holly moving into the mansion, her ascension to number one girlfriend, all the way through Bridget being introduced to the group, and then Kendra, all the way to the beginning of the girls next door filming. So in the meantime, on Tuesday... I will be a guest on the podcast, So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey, who you might remember as being a guest on this podcast a little while ago where we talked about Pretty Wild and the episode was pretty wild. It was pretty wildly good. So if you want to go back and check that out or listen to me on Ryan's fabulous podcast, please do. And finally, please consider giving a rating and review of this podcast on iTunes. iTunes. It's not really iTunes anymore. I guess it's just Apple Podcasts. Um, But iTunes really rolls off the tongue. Um, Please consider giving a rating and review. It really helps. It's free and it's easy. And it makes a big impact for a little old podcaster like myself. It puts you higher up in the charts and it makes you look like a a real professional and not just some schmo talking into a, a microphone that's attached to nothing. Okay, well, without further adieu, here is the episode with the gorgeous, the intrepid, Troy Mikidi. Hello and welcome, everyone. This is Darlene. As always, the podcast, they do you remember this? And today I have... um. I mean, a real banger of a guest. You know him. You love him. It's Mr. Troy McKeady. Troy, how are you? Sarah, I'm so much better now, but I am actually very, very excited to talk about this with you today. I am so excited to talk about this with you. We will be recapping episode one, season one, episode one, the pilot of the girls next door. Troy, paint a picture for me. What are the memories that surround you when you think of that show, when you think of that time? Be my Picasso. Paint me the picture. Um, well, I definitely remember watching in high school. And I remember it just being like one of those group shows. Like I would watch it with all my friends and we would like, it was a real like marathon binge mm, kind mm-hmm. of like, you know, E was always doing marathons with the girls next door. It was always playing And it was just such an easy show to watch the same episode of 90 times. So yeah, I just remember sitting around with my friends and, you know, like critiquing, you know, in the way that you do when you're really young, just being like, I like her body. (laughs) I like her body more. No, I just like, I just like love her butt. No, like the thing I love is just like her abs. Like, look at her abs, like right there, like pause it right there and like zoom in. Just being really gross, you know? Uh, But yeah, I loved it. I was obsessed with it. Um, This first episode is an interesting episode because it's a a cobbling together of the original pilot presentation Mm -hmm. before the show was going to be strictly about the girls the original i know you know this um but the original idea for the show was hef's world and it's hef and his um house staff right and have you ever seen the original pilot presentation or parts of it i think that i watched parts of it to do my holly and hef episode but i don't really remember a lot about it well i could only find the first 10 minutes of it it's very interesting because um, in the episode of the girl, the first episode of Girls Next Door, as we know it today, it all kind of opens the same way where it's like, welcome to the mansion. And mm. then instead of just like diving right in to like, here's half, okay, now here's the girls. They spend all of this time with all of the random people who work around the house in the just the worst clothes because they're working and they're like, well, right. um, we're, we're building, um, a slip and slide today and, um. <laughs> I'm like, I'm making half his soup. <laughs> 
they're like they one of the girls would like a dog psychic to come over so we're building a dog psychic teepee in the yard by hand um the way the girls next door pilot starts they open the door welcome to the playboy mansion we see just a little um puttering around of people answering phones and then they bring Hef his lunch in bed and did you take in any of what was on that tray (laughs) okay I didn't take in what was on the tray the only I was just so because I watched it twice and I was just so caught off guard by how menacing Hef was because he's not like on in that moment for the camera (laughs) he was so cold And then he realized he was on camera and like kind of perked up a bit, but it was like, eek. Yes, that is exactly right. And it makes total sense when you watch the, um, the original pilot, because right before she brings that tray in, everyone in the kitchen is basically rock, paper, scissoring who has to bring him his food. Ugh. And they're like, no, you, like, no, I did it last week. Please, please. You know, it's so funny. I know, I know that you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, but the show, this show was so masterful at sort of repackaging dark, yes. weird moments with like cutesy music and really fun editing. One thing that I really noticed in watching, not just this episode, but watching every single episode pretty much within, I don't know, the span of two weeks is this first season, Hef has not, and I think the creators and the editors and stuff, but especially Hef, they haven't figured out in that first season how bad Hef can potentially look. And there's Mm. a lot of honest moments of you can really see the underbelly of what was going on in that house because Hef wasn't as aware of himself. But then after that first Mm -hmm. season... You really never see that scary side of him again. Like Holly has a lot of mentions of like, oh yeah, Hef thinks I'm ugly. Right. (laughs) Jesus Christ. It's true. (laughs) You're so right though. Oh my God. But after this first season, you never hear that stuff again. It's very interesting. Yeah. You can also see it too in the way that the girls talk to him like they you can tell first of all you can definitely tell that the camera is adding this element of like maybe I don't get to talk to you like this normally yes Mm -hmm. but we're like being playful right now because there's a camera here and you know it's just it, it you can just tell that they're like terrified of him like you can really see how fearful the girls are of him this in this first season. You definitely can. The first 10 minutes of the episode is really just introducing people in a very inartful way. Right. I'm Holly. Um, I've been here for this many years. I'm Bridget and I'm Kendra. But then once you yeah. get past that, like when they're going to the AFI awards and Kendra's late and oh Holly, that I think that talking head is the most chilling. Kendra really needs to get a secretary because she's really scatterbrained as far as being in the right place at the right time or being on time or remembering she has to do something. Sometimes we're stuck in a situation where Hef is like, where's Kendra? And I'm like, well, I told her a million times and it doesn't matter. Hef will get grumpy with me. Why didn't you tell Kendra that we're leaving at such and such a time? And I'm like, I did. So that's not that comfortable. Listen, I am so happy that you brought this up because I wanted to ask you if you, so when you were younger, because when I was younger, I always felt like, I've always been obsessed with trying to find like the B plot in reality shows that they maybe don't present, but are there. Like on Vanderpump Rules, there's like a B plot that they're all on fucking Adderall. You know what I mean? And like they talk around it or just full on like having a Coke moment. Yes. And on this, obviously, the B plot is that Bridget and and Holly are friends and Kendra isn't really yes. friends with them. And that Holly and Kendra do not like each other. And Holly fucking hates having to live with her. Understandably, Absolutely. by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> She's like this 18-year-old little fucker bebopping around, body rolling all over the house. Like her dogs are everywhere, shitting all over the place. Her room's a fucking border <laughs> mess. Like, she's, like, so entitled because she, like, is, you know, Hef's favorite gal. So she can just kick his door in and demand shit while Hailey can't even wear red (laughs) lipstick. I I mean, it's really, you can just feel, like, I've always 
sort of sided with Holly in that sense where I'm like, I wouldn't be able to fucking live with her. I completely agree. And I, well, so one thing that I didn't really realize until I started um, researching Girls Next Door and like talking about it on Instagram and stuff is how many people were were Kendra girls. And right. I never realized that because I was, I was mu- like, like you said, I was like, yeah, Holly is annoyed with Kendra. I would want to smack this girl in the face too. Right. But watching it now, it, I have a very different perspective where Kendra does have like a really interesting perspective of coming into this because of the three women, Bridget and Holly had this reverence for Playboy and they had like an understanding of mm. of the importance or the how iconic it was they had the reverence for it Kendra didn't give a shit mm. so she could right. come in there and blow the the roof off the place and do whatever she wanted because she didn't really have I'd say the misguided respect for the place that maybe Holly and Bridget did I totally agree with that for sure and so I like watching Kendra in that way like now having a full understanding of it but it's also you look at holly and bridget compared to kendra two of those people are stone cold dorks nerd dorks giggly dorks like they and they're the same exact kind Mm -hmm. of dork which is so which is so interesting before the other you know four other women that used to live there moved out they all couldn't stand bridget and holly too Mm -hmm. yeah of course they didn't like them these were two Disney adults. Yeah, they're dorks. I mean, like, this is the first episode and Holly has Princess Leia buns. It's the first episode and she has fucking Princess Leia buns. That is her her night on the town. They're going to the AFI Awards to honor George Lucas and uh, Star Wars. And Holly takes that opportunity to wear Princess Leia buns. I mean, like, if that doesn't tell you who they are in a nutshell and why they get along so well and why they have nothing in common. And I agree with you. I, I Even now, like, I've always thought that Kendra added such an interesting element to the show. And I think she's so much of the reason for the show's mm-hmm. success. I don't think that it would have... I think that the show, like, could have had a moment without Bridget or Holly. But I don't think that it would have been what it was without Kendra. Like, I think that she's the most important player yeah. here, almost. Like, some, like honestly, she's... She is the show. She's like, she's the f- exciting one. It she is the one that absolutely needs to be there. She's the she's the comedic relief, but I think she's the most important element, but I I feel like they're also um we need five for the power of spice. All three of totally. them um play very opposite roles. Like even Holly and Bridget, even though they're so similar spiritually, mm-hmm. there you still have the the sweet up 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 one and then you have holly Mm -hmm. rolling her eyes and you you need that person too but yeah kendra is the most important as i mean i would say she's an audience surrogate but i guess like i guess i guess she is like kind of the audience surrogate of coming yeah yeah i think you're right of coming in and being like uh why are we doing this Right. And like, even her being presented as like when Holly was like, Kendra's the newest girlfriend. She's been here for like, just a little over a year. Um, You know, like the experience is the most new to her and she's the most sort of fish out of water about it. Like all of it just, you know, she's so young that like any experience that she's having at that moment in her life would be, she'd be wide eyed about it. So the fact that she's like living in the Playboy Mansion it is to me, like she is the closest thing we have to like a Greek chorus. And I know that Holly basically narrates the show, but I don't know. I still feel like we view it through Kendra in a lot of ways. Yeah, and she she's also the closest in age to the audience that was actually watching the show at the time. Totally. That's such a good point. Which, which is like another thing. Uh, Holly does say in the episode, Kendra's six years younger than me. And then I was like, oh my God, she was like, what, a decade younger than Bridget? Can yeah. You imagine suddenly living with god bless an 18 year old from san diego i can't some fucking kid who can't stop body rolling and twerking it's funny that you brought up the spice girls because the other thing i wanted to bring up to you that i have always i guess sort of instinctively known but i've never like written down and thought about was like 
<clears throat> excuse me, like the way that they were presented, you know, like the show was like obviously in this first episode establishing their characters and like their role and who they are in the house and in the relationship. And they were sort of presented as a girl yes. group. Like it gave very girl group vibes. And I just thought it was so funny that like, you know, Kendra was the young, spunky, sporty. She's sporty spice. Yeah. Like she's, you know, she's crazy. She's wacky. She's fun. You never know what she'll do, blah, blah, blah. And then of course, Bridget is, uh, you know, really sweet and uh, very girly and like hyper feminine. And, you know, she's just like, she's bubbles, yeah. right? And Holly's identity is Hef. Like they present Holly to only have one interest and that's Hef. And it's so interesting because so they position Bridget from from the get-go is Bridget is the smart one um she is getting her master's degree and she's always doing her homework <laughs> <laughs> but if you read Holly's memoir you realize oh she was like taking French lessons the entire time she was there and like taking all these different classes she was also the smart one with a lot of interests. Right. Holly's only interest is Hef, but she has a lot of interests. And I'm surprised that they wouldn't position her as, oh, she's the dork. She's the hot dork. Right. I know. Because even, and I guess may, you're right. Like it did maybe sort of become mm -hmm. that, but I almost feel like that's only because she has so many interests and she's so you know, sort of pop culture savvy. And she knows she has such a, a, an encyclopedic knowledge of the magazine and, you know, all of the covers and like the photography, like she really, it's like, it's pouring out of her so much that they couldn't help. Like we still saw it even with them trying to sort of edit it out. It was still so obvious that like, she's just such a, a media nerd. Yeah. And it's, it makes her, so much more interesting and then you you realize with Bridget too like she's also someone who's hyper interested in stuff in her horror movies mm -hmm. and like ghost stuff yep. and then you go to Kendra another hyper interested person who knows all yep. about sports and likes to play every kind of sport <laughs> and loves and too loves short. too short <laughs> and she is obsessed with getting her grills <laughs> and sneakers the other thing about the whole show though is how when you find out about the behind the scenes stuff how they always said to them you know you're replaceable right and it's just amazing when you rewatch it like how irreplaceable they are like you're not gonna find these three very specific women at the playboy mansion not that mm -hmm. there aren't plenty of interesting lovely women coming and going but these are three very specific people they're extremely interesting people like they are so magnetic yes it's like you know the joy of this show is just going into their th and the camera going into their bedrooms like them opening up kendra's room in the middle of her body <laughs> rolling on a pile of dirty clothes like to me that is pure ecstasy and obviously they got the last laugh like they are not replaceable because when they did replace them the show was terrible. It was so bad. Yeah. It's like they're obviously not replaceable because you tried to replace them and your show fucking got canceled. Yeah. Sorry, Hef. You weren't the um, guiding light of uh, of this little endeavor. Hate to tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You think that you walking in and going, hey, 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 while you like putter around, <laughs> like you really think that you're driving 18 year old girls to watch the show? In Come on. Somewhere in that. And that sick little, sick little brain that is just pickled by Pepsi. <laughs> he thinks that, that we're all coming for that guy. <laughs> yeah. He thinks that it's a, a, a cultural phenomenon because of him like ordering his <laughs> veggie soup in bed. This is absurd. Oh my, speaking of his laugh, one, one moment in the show when they're on the red carpet at the AFI awards and someone asks him a question, a reporter asks him a question and um, they're like, so how's it going, Hef? And he like looks around at, at the girls 
And he's like, I think it's going pretty well. <laughs> oh my God. It is so chilling. <laughs> Um, he's like, uh, what, what's the guy from saw the, the little, the little man from saw. He is like, jigsaw. He is like it feels like full jigsaw. <laughs> oh my God. I'm crying. That was so funny. I know that. Cause that moment really stuck out. Like, I was just like, God, he's so, well, that moment stuck out to me because it made me realize I was like, why aren't they talking to, um, because Holly was like, it's our job to go on the red carpet and smile. And when they ask us questions, we nod our heads up and down and we don't say a lot. And I was like, oh, because they didn't, nobody knew who you were yet. What my role involves is just standing there and smiling and looking like a nice little first lady astronaut's wife and not acting up or doing anything stupid. Did you ever get your hands on Leia's buns? <laughs> right here. You, you've read Holly's book, right? Yeah. Do you remember there's one part in it where it's before, she, I, I think she's maybe the number one girlfriend at this point, but there's still seven of them around and they're talking at mm-hmm. MTV and they're having some, they're interviewing half and they ask him some question that he just completely spaces on. And he kind of like has, I guess, a senior moment. And starts kind of stuttering and Holly just like kind of just, you know, steps in and is like, oh yeah, you remember that, right, honey? And he's like, oh yeah, 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 blah, 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 blah. And then after the interview's over, he's like, don't you ever do that again. Oh yeah. You humiliated me. Oh oh my God. So she is, that is another instance of this was one of the more real looks into what was going on where it's like, yeah, we're not allowed to talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can definitely tell too, like what this first season was, was actually half's ideal situation for filming this show because the girls weren't famous Mm -hmm. yet, but they, they were like getting all of this extra attention and they were on E or whatever. And they had not reached up, you know, that moment of like the cameras not wanting to talk to half yeah. anymore, you know, to people not really having a lot of interest in him and being way more interested in the girls than him. I mean, if you're on a red carpet and it's season three of the girls next door, <clears throat> are you going to talk to half over Kendra? Like, fuck never. No. Well, and he also, as the seasons go on, clearly gets more jealous of them because it goes from, oh, yeah, you guys go off and do your thing. I'll, like, walk into the room and you can you can say, hi, honey, and then I'll leave. Mm-hmm. But then as it goes on, it's, oh, we have to cut, o- cut away from the girls on their trip to Jamaica to, like, mm-hmm. follow mm-hmm. Hef around where there's still girls there. And it's like oh, I still have the girls around, you know. Mm -hmm. And like Holly having to pretend to call him so he can have a scene, which he demanded. Right. Hi, honey. (laughs) It's like these like super uncomfortable forced like paint. I mean, the the true definition of painted smile is any moment of Holly's happiness during this time. Like, Holly did not experience a a pure moment of happiness or joy the entire time they filmed this show, unless she was like in a room alone with Bridget. It is so true. And it really is just a stroke of luck that the show came when it did because so she was like a, Holly had been a girlfriend for three and a half years, which is way past the shelf life of most of his girlfriends after 1999. And I think- from day one of filming, she was actually ready to go. I think so too. She seems, she's so emotionally checked out. Like she she truly defines what it means to be going through the motions. Oh, yeah. Like there's just no, she's not present really in any moment. She's like glossed over. She's c- so clearly annoyed. Like my favorite scenes of this show, and there's actually a really great one in this episode where, um, Kendra comes like literally kicks the door in and she's like honey can we watch a movie on the big screen <laughs> and, like, she, and you can see Holly in the background like shaking like trembling into her book hi honey rascal rascal's in here 
Um, is it okay if um, Dusty and I watch um, a movie down on the big screen? Sure. Okay. What do you want to watch? Can we watch that Napoleon Dynamite? Have you got it or have I got it? I think you do. All right, yeah, I think you and like doing everything she can to not look up because if she does, they'll catch that her eyes are bloodshot red at that point. Like she is miserable. Miserable. It is um, like the episode, if you remember their, um, their fifth anniversary where they uh, bring the melting pot to Holly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's like season <laughs> season three and um she gives half a card and he's reading it and she bursts into tears and everyone's like oh holly you love him so much and i remember watching it even at the time and thinking no that is a woman going what am i doing with my life yeah like that's a woman actually (laughs) sobbing there's no happiness behind that cry. I also just thought it was so interesting in this episode, listening to the girls talk about, you know, their their sort of origin story with Hef. And like, yes. they all, every single one of them said like, you know, it's an, like specifically Bridget was like, you know, I could not pass up the opportunity. Like it's the opportunity of a lifetime to date Hef. And it, like literally talking about it, like it's an internship. Oh my God. Yeah. And Kendra, I actually noted too, she says my dream was to go out and you know have a good time and live my life i want to start early i'm gonna, I'm gonna live life so uh, now i'm here and the schedule is like perfect for me it's my job as you know as a girlfriend you know like, we have the same routine every week so i kind of see that as a job and now we know what that routine it really is the way they frame that sound bite is like well i mean i kind of think this is a job we have a routine right and it's like do 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 right <laughs> What we know now, I'm like, oh no, Kendra was exactly right. Mm -hmm. This was a job. Yeah. This was, you literally have to clock in to the house every night at 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. Like you have your hours, your clothing stipend, you have your like 30% off at Hollister. Like you get your thousand bucks a week (laughs) to go, to go buy your club clothes. Yeah. And you're like, you have a routine orchestrated sex night that is everybody in place I mean it's choreographed choreographed yes it's almost like um it's almost like a performance of sleep no more that is just every single day right 24 hours a day yes yes every day (laughs) it's like a tour comes through the mansion and like the girls are just like here's our um Monday choreography of (laughs) The boys come over for their uh, backgammon game. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> While Casablanca plays up on the big screen, <laughs> yeah. Hef's favorite movie, the only one he'll watch. Oh, yes, we all file in and we say, hey, honey, and then we walk out. We all do our signature laugh. <laughs> they all have a signature laugh, they was do. one thing I realized. They Every do. single one of them. And it's really, it's heavily edited into the show. It's a huge identifier. Like it's the, I mean, I think it gave Kendra a career in reality television. I think it it literally gave her a decade long career. Well, what's funny is that I remember people, of course, talking about Kendra's laugh, but then I realized they all have the most distinct laughs Right. where Hef is like completely maniacal. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Pure evil. (laughs) Pure evil, pure evil. Bridget is like, <laughs> yeah, very breathy, giggly. And then Holly is much like the light that has gone out from behind her eyes. That is her laugh. It's so, it's like, <laughs> yes, yes. It's so, empty. and it's literally like, this is what I do to cope. It's like, mm-hmm. it's literally, it's like nail biting, but a laugh. It's complete. An utter disassociation, <laughs> truly at all times. And it's crazy because I was looking at them and I'm like, I feel like they're my age in this mm-hmm. just because, you know, I, I hate to tell you, but that kind of uh, bleach blonde, it, that can age a person a little. <laughs> How dare you? I mean, I guess Bridget, Bridget was like 30. Holly and Kendra, my God. I know. Kendra's hair. Oh is- my God, in this first episode is so outrageous it is 
so insane, especially during a time when like straighteners were having a true moment. And she was like, no, not for me. Not for me. It's air dry honey. And it's all, it's blunt cut at the, like, you know, in the middle of the shoulder, like just no layers. Nothing. It's a pure white, bushy, thick mess. Thick, so thick. She's thick. Holly has the bright, bright hair. But it just has it, it just hits different. On right. Holly. It's like toned in a way that's like human. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is women at that time, you know, with their bleach blonde, they just didn't realize the nuance of a toner. Oh, um, one more one more um <laughs> thought that I had. Did you pick up on this one small moment? Kendra has a talking head and she goes, My boyfriend is so charming. So charming. And he is an excellent man. You know, I love him. He loves me. <laughs> he brings joy to my life. Oh, yes. Oh, I sure sure enough did. Um, first of all, like the discomfort in her even calling him her boyfriend. You can tell yes. that it just, it takes everything in her to even fucking spit out the word. Because it's so disingenuous and like just so like, it's so cringy. It it kind of, so the first time I watched it, I was like, is is she zannied to the gills or something? She has a lot of talking head moments like that where she's randomly just very fucking subdued. Very very molasses-y. Slow like honey. Slow like honey. But the second time I watched it, I had a different perspective of it where it felt like just like you said, like her saying boyfriend, it felt like she was choking on those words and that the producers <laughs> must have made her go through that like 10 times to get that sound bite. Totally. Yeah, because there's another moment too where she's like, um, where she says like, I love being in a relationship with Hef. Like, I'm so happy that he's my boyfriend when she's like walking through the house. She does, yeah, you could just tell she doesn't want to be saying that word. Like, it's uncomfortable for her to have to even because they all know they it's like everybody knows the thing but like they all live in this like very heightened state of delusion all the time yes because they have to you know but then it's like these cameras are here and now we have to talk about this weird thing that we do well there's another part in holly's book where she talks about how one of the producers is like so do you think that kendra is growing up at the mansion because she's 18 years old Mm-hmm. And Holly refuses to basically parrot back Kendra's growing up at the mansion. And the producer seems so perplexed as to why she refuses to say it. Right. But Kendra is literally like, some people go to college. She went to the Playboy Mansion. Yeah. And it's uncomfortable to have to be like, yes, that the, the little girl that I'm in a uh, sister wives relationship <laughs> with. Yes. She is growing quite nicely here at the mansion she had just turned 18 what it's insane because if you yeah when you think about it too hard you're like oh no this is not good you have to suspend reality a little bit and they do like i said they do a good job of just always like just always it's you know it's just gumdrops and lollipops and everybody's walking on clouds and there's whimsy and camp and photo shoots and parties and themes and puffin you know it's very cutesy whatever but like that the the menacing like you couldn't be in it that's the fucking american horror story house basically you couldn't be in a darker house absolutely i wanted to ask you if so like this is kind of like reverting back to the scene of hef getting his beef stew in bed or whatever um his like great his cut and half grapefruit um there's a moment where like the camera is like I know, you know exactly they're following the... <laughs> what you are about to say. <laughs> the camera's like following the chef or whatever into the room. And we get this very sort of raw, here's Hef's bedroom moment. I'm like, um, I forgot about the house being so fucking dirty. <laughs> it is so scary. It is I've never seen, you know who um, had more magazines than Hef 
was maybe like me when I was 17. And I at least put them in a box under the bed. They're just like magazines (laughs) everywhere. And toys, so many toys. So many toys, so many like, um, like posters that aren't hung they're just up against the wall in big clutters and dirty very very dirty dirty carpet nasty carpet like nasty like mauve and green carpet everywhere the the thing about half is that no one talks about is there is some sort of obsessive compulsive disorder that's like manifesting where he has major hoarder tendencies he also will only eat Mm. like five different foods he also is a recluse a recluse Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, there is a lot a lot going on with this man (laughs) and we're all just like oh my god he's so cute he's so romantic he's just like he's like the taylor swift of pornography he's just so romantic at heart (laughs) hi honey hi honey (laughs) it's it's true because he's a man who and it's it's so into that sort of like you know that michael jackson kind of success fame alienation Mm -hmm. isolation where like You've gone your whole life never having anybody tell you what your problems are. You've never faced any sort of pushback, really, you know, in like an everyday sense. Like you just have been able to live as weirdly as to the point that now you're like this curmudgeon, obsessive man. And there's also this weird thing. I think that the scrapbooking thing is very fucking weird. Like that's another OCD I think it's weird. thing. That's I think that is also a compulsive tendency where he has to document everything. I mean, listen, I'm I'm not a um therapist. Um I mean, right. maybe I'm like Dax Shepard, I'm the armchair expert, but <laughs> for someone to have 2000 scrapbooks that have every single mention of him in the press, good or bad. Like they have an in-house photographer who would take pictures every time they would leave the house for a club night. They would be photographers like walking around and taking pictures of Hef, playing cards. Like there was someone documenting every single thing that happened pretty much every single day it's just such a weird like self-important or it's such a strange orbit and it's also to me it gives me very like it's it's you know definitely OCD and obsessive and also just like such a fear of anybody else like having control over your narrative like yes there's obviously a fear there of being a forgotten and b you know, having somebody tell your story in a way that maybe you don't approve, um, which I understand, but it's like, it's to an extreme that is, that everybody around him knows is absolutely psychotic, but none of them can say anything. Here, Here's one thing that I find so interesting is Holly's book is really the only book that I think we've ever really seen that paints Hef the way he actually was totally but what I realized in doing my research for this podcast is there's actually like I would say at least five books that are similar to Holly's like a sort of tell-all warts and all book about Hef about Playboy all of those other books are out of print and I'm pretty sure it was Playboy as an entity killing the books Mm. meanwhile there's all of these other books that are sanctioned by playboy that all say the same thing about how great hef is because he was so protective of that like you know his uh, i always call it like somebody's like marvel story like it's like their origin Mm -hmm. story it's like you know the comic book like issue one story and it's a complete farce like everything that he says about even down to like Marilyn Monroe all of it's bullshit but he it's the same story being told for decades and decades and decades that is fake 
Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the same as like, it's the same thing as like Britney's rags, rags to riches story and being raised in Louisiana and having, it, it's like a star's yes. folklore tale. Absolutely. Well, and yeah, there are so many different parts of Hef's origin story, quote unquote, that, I mean, you do any amount of digging and you're like, oh, all of, there's so much lore. If you know that it's fake, you can very easily like look it up and it's like, oh no, that, that didn't happen that way. That like, oh, uh, Hef was this incredible businessman. No, he was actually like a really terrible businessman. That's why his daughter took over in 1982 or something. Like, I don't, yeah, he's just obsessed with creating a really cool origin story for himself. It has really worked for him up until this point, baby, because we're blowing the roof off of it. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's crazy that Hef was able to basically sir, like his story and that like I said that crazy orbit that he created was able to survive for so many decades and then then Gen Z came along and said what's Playboy oh no no oh, oh no oh uh-uh. no they're like okay so he's gone and then who was this Eminem oh he said what Put his mom in a trunk no uh uh-uh. totally understand why Gen Z's are like millennials please go tuck yourself back into bed because what were you doing in the early 2000s right like did you guys have no you had no standards you guys were just you was accepted everything truly and you just monster people like truly monster drunk people drinking our four locos and being like this all checks out yes you can call girls fat or whatever. It's totally fine. Everything's gay. If somebody's annoying, it's gay. Oh my God, you're so gay. <laughs> Something's so gay. You're freaking you're gay. Freaking ga- <laughs> oh my God, you think it's weird that Hugh Hefner is dating an 18-year-old? Um, Are you gay or like, what's the deal? I think it's hot. Like, it's like hot. he's so sweet. <laughs> he's so sweet. And they don't even have sex. Like, I don't even know what, you're, what the problem is. Holly loves him so oh my much. God. It's so cute. He's really going to have a baby with Holly her. Loves he's him. 80 years old. Yeah. He's going to finally give her the baby and marry her. I really like, <laughs> where were our heads? Where were they at? I don't know. An 80 year old man. I don't know. Like we really didn't question anything. You know, you Nothing. know what's so funny too is they say this in the episode holly says you know she gets the same questions all the time one of the big ones is do you guys have sex what Mm -hmm. is so funny is that is was like a very common question i think for for all of them for the previous girlfriends do you have sex with him i feel like i remember looking back on it and thinking like i don't i mean i really don't know if they have sex I, i feel like they probably don't but then I'm also at the same time, like, he's going to give her a baby. Right, <laughs> Like, exactly. they don't have sex, but, like, I'm sure they're going to have a baby. Yeah. As she's, like, white-knuckling it and trying to Uma Thurman her way through all these different <laughs> girls. Like, as if that's even o- a, an okay thing to have to do. <laughs> it's crazy. It It's truly bizarre. And Gen Z, deliver us from this evil. Okay. <laughs> like, what... <laughs> We know. know not what we do, Gen Z. We are sorry. I know. The other day I was talking to Molly about Gen Z and she was like, wait until they find out about fucking Howard Stern. <laughs> like, wait until the until Gen Z finds out who he is. And they're going to be like, wait, what? He did what? <laughs> what did he say? Oh, he's canceled. Cancel him. Hashtag cancel Howard Stern. <laughs> Hashtag canceled. Another funny thing is... um. I've mentioned Howard in some of my podcasts and I will get DMs from people who are like our age, but are not from America. And they'll be like, Mm. can you explain Howard Stern to me? How did this happen? What, what is this? Oh my God. And it's happened several times where I'm like, it's, um, gosh, well, (laughs) Well, the 90s were a crazy time here in America. Well, uh... well, the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, gosh, uh, well, I could tell you about the time that Steven Tyler uh, adopted a 16-year-old so he could have a sexual relationship. Um, I, right. I, listen, 
<laughs> Are you familiar with the term bimbo? Do you, Do you know, know what it means? means? Um, well, in a real bimbo moment in the '90s. We liked to present them and tear them down. Uh, it was fun to watch Howard point out uh, things he didn't like about women's bodies and make them stand there and spin around and then orgasm on a machine until they collapsed. Uh, uh, well, and that that's the other thing too, is I have only um, presented on the podcast how he's talked about celebrities that he, like celebrity women that he has right. had to at least have some level of decorum, which is still a very low level. But mm. then there's all those um, mm-hmm. women who were not famous. And it was like, yeah, come into the studio and let's do horrible, horrible things to you on air. Truly, yeah. like sorority yep. fraternity level hazing, but live on air and by a much older adult male. Yeah. While I'm asking you, by the way, if you've like, had like sexual assault issues if you've been molested asking all of these things laughing about it and also then telling you to literally get on an orgasm machine just so we can see how long you last on it on e i mean i used to watch that show at night as a kid all the fucking time and i thought it was amazing see i my parents loved howard stern they always said how um when i was a baby and i wouldn't fall asleep they would put me in the car and they drive around the neighborhood and listen to Howard Stern. And I was like, okay, so that's my origin story. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like actually perfect. But I, I never got into it. I, I was always like, wait, what? This guy is disgusting. Why does he get to talk about very attractive women? And he is so profoundly unattractive. What's going on here? There was no greater fear <clears throat> than knowing that somebody you really like was going on Howard Stern. Yes. Like that for me is like, even thinking about it right now, I'm getting goosebumps because I'm like, you know, the announcement of like, oh, so-and-so is going to be on Howard Stern. And it's like, here we fucking go. Oh my God. Like, what's he going to say? What's he going to bring up? Like, I'm I'm going to be mortified for an hour. It's so funny that you mentioned talking to Molly about this, like, what happens when Gen Z like truly figures this out? Will their heads actually explode? Because watching them figure out who like David Letterman is and oh they God. were like completely aghast. Uh, uh, you know. Baby dolls. Uh, have we got- I'd say like click away from the David Dobricks and the, the Trisha Paytas is on YouTube for a second and really like, like really like go there when it comes to Letterman or Leno or any of the the guys. Like if you really want to see, oh come on, I can't even I can't even go there right now because this will be. I know, hour. I know. We, you and I, we are we are so bad. Like uh, we could we could go, I know we could Terrible. go on forever. Listen, was this quote unquote recap of the first episode? <laughs> Um, what a great, very succinct, completely linear recap. Listen, listen, you want it in a nutshell? We got to meet the staff. Yes. Holly she basically told us in a nutshell that she hates Kendra without saying it. Uh, uh watched Napoleon Dynamite. Yes. Bridget got gizmo groomed. <laughs> I mean, like, if you want the true tea, that is the true tea. <laughs> yeah. It turns out the groomers were able to, in fact, fit gizmo gizzy in that day. <laughs> Thank um, the Lord. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> oh, and they went to a, a party. They, yes. They, um, they went to the AFI party and um, Holly wore her Princess Leia cinnamon rolls on her ears, even though Hef Mm -hmm. said he thinks they're going to be weird and ugly. I'm a Star Wars fan, so I'm going to go with my hair done like Princess Leia. You told Hef what you want today? He knows? Yeah, he knows. He's nervous. (laughs) When I told Hef I was going to do it, he goes, can you do that with your hair? Thank you, guys. (laughs) And Hef is not excited about that. He thinks that's weird and that I'll look ugly, but... It's like he has eight other girls on his arm so he can afford to have one weirdo. Actually, that there's the series, baby. I mean, that is it in a nutshell. It's a lot of, you know, blank stares, mm-hmm. a lot of Holly in the background looking like she wants to kill someone um, and just disassociating. It's a lot of Kendra going, oh, 
and one and like fucking twerking around the house and body rolling in the kitchen with the chefs. I mean, you guys know you the guys game. know the game. Um, and then also like the butlers just being like, the dogs eat better than we do. <laughs> hey, it's Holly. Can I get my usual breakfast with four small servings of dog food, please? Thank you. No problem. Bye. <laughs> It's funny, I think the dogs get the, get the good life here and they tend to come here and get lazy and fat, so <laughs> we have to put them on a diet. Sometimes they even eat better than we do. <laughs> That's okay, though. Yeah, it's okay. You know, why not? All righty. <laughs> it's a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it's what reality TV used to be, which was just mundane slice of life. And I really, uh, no shade, because I, I, I miss it. I, I do too. And I will say this, and I've said it a million times since I've rewatched it. This is, um, it's great pandemic viewing. You really can, um, oh, yeah. like Holly, disassociate. Just sit down, mm -hmm. stare through that TV, the bright colors mm -hmm. and like a cacophony of laughter from different voices and just um, just zone until you get that vaccine. Right. And you can also, this is the perfect show to look at your phone yes. while you watch. Oh, because you won't miss like, a thing. You'll miss a couple, you know, jump cuts of Gizzy, yep. of Gizmo, um, or of like, you know, Kendra piling up dirty underwear in her room. I mean, it's really, it's just like a weird comfort viewing. I don't know. It, it's comfort viewing. To me, it's the the great British bake off or something. It's just like no fighting. <laughs> yes. And low stakes. Low stakes and like the fashion. The fashion is great because no one has any taste. So it feels very much mm -hmm. like you're um, back in that world. Like when all the girls go to the, the red carpet, they're wearing like Charlotte Russe evening gowns that you would wear to homecoming in 2005. It just like, it takes you back and you can just zone out, like get a glass right. of wine, get a hard seltzer, disassociate. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The fashion is like just so incredible. It's so fun to watch them just do things in like little tiny itty bitty denim pleated skirts and, you know, knee high um, athletic socks and like really ugly fur lined hoodies. Oh my God. The fur uh, lined <laughs> honey. Did I have some Abercrombie and <laughs> Fitch fur lined hoodies? Oh. Don't you dare put that fur in the washer. Don't you dare, mom. Oh my. It was a $90 hoodie. <laughs> the little girl, when I was a Manny, oh my um, because I was a Manny for like a decade, actually, like a really long time. I raised people's kids. That's my dream to be raised by you. Yeah, I was a fun Manny. Like I'm I was sure. great. I, I did hair. Oh my God. I learned how to like straighten and curl hair and give blowouts. And I mean, I was like, it was fun. And one of the, families that I manied for um one of the kids was like a teenager and she had a, a sister who was like a full-blown baby and like it's so funny because she could have very easily been like babysitting her own sister <laughs> but like they were paying me to just be there with this teenager who was doing it um so I would always like do her hair and like she would you know we were like she was like my little sister basically and she lived in this fur lined hoodie, like lived in it to the point that it had become matted in a way that I was like, Samantha, I won't allow this anymore. Like you can't wear this anymore. It can't even be put away. Like you have to talk, like the fur is matted into dreadlocks. You're wearing a dreadlock hoodie. It's sickening. The absolute privilege to have you as a Manny, <laughs> just not just for your spirit, but for your <laughs> guidance and having the bravery to put a stop to a dreaded fur hoodie. May we all have a Troy Manny in our life. <laughs> Honestly, it's the greatest. It's the, it, it it's every base is covered. It's like, you know, I am Manny and your, your baby, but I'm also giving your daughter a blowout for her first date. I would love if you could transition to a lady sitter like uh, Kyle <laughs> Richards and just just like nanny me <laughs> as, right. as an adult, as an adult woman. Just like feed you <laughs> and like curl your hair and then like tuck you in at night. You know, sometimes because I was also like a teenager, 
the teenage girl would like convince I was like an older teenager she was like a tween and sometimes she would convince me to do really terrible things that I knew was like so bad (laughs) and one of like I'd be like Sam this is so like you're going to get me in so much trouble but we were like fucking road dogs (laughs) and one night she was like she goes I really want my belly button pierced (gasps) and I was like your mom's not gonna let you pierce your belly button you're psychotic and she's like well I'm gonna do it myself (gasps) and I was like Sam you cannot you cannot (gasps) And she like manipulated me into being, I was like, well, I'm going to be in the room, Samantha, because if oh. something goes wrong, I'm going to call fucking 911. And then she's like, all I have to do is this. And she's like, I was like, no, you don't. You have to put it as like ice this part of your stomach. You can't do that, Sam. You have to push it in like that. And then all of a sudden I'm piercing this girl's fucking belly uh-huh. button as a teenager, as a teenager with like a dirty fucking needle. <laughs> And her mom came home and she was like, what are you guys doing? I was like, we're piercing Sam's belly button. I was like, she wanted a belly ring. I love that you guys were having a full on parent trap moment. I also love how um, it's like, yeah, she could have theoretically been babysitting uh, the, the actual baby. And it's like, right. Maybe you needed also a slightly older babysitter. <laughs> right, seriously. Like, clearly, I mean, it was like, it was a real, a real, I could write a book, honestly. It was a crazy time. Oh my God, Troy, Um, we are literally out of control. It's insane. We, we need to be stopped, honestly. Throw, throw, us, throw us in jail, throw us in the Playboy Mansion, throw away the key. <laughs> We, we have lost it. Troy, tell everyone where they can find you because Lord knows they, they don't already know who you are because you're not always on this podcast. Oh, well, my name is Troy and I have a podcast too. It's called Dunzo and it's spelled D-U-N-Z-O with an exclamation point. And I like to point out the exclamation point because when you search for it in Google, it's easier to find. Ooh. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, and whatever people use that have androids that I don't ever know the name and well I have a patreon and it's patreon.com slash solid listen I've been podcasting for four years and there's a psychotic manic archive I mean there's so much it's all worth it um I mean I feel like we have a a couple episodes on there that are you know oh it's worth it to get behind that paywall if listen if you're a fan of Dara which I think if you've got if you're listening to this podcast and gotten this far there are many many dara episodes that are fun we i mean try and i we have a good time i, I you know <laughs> yeah, us girls go way back we go way back we go way back <laughs> uh, troy i love you so much uh you bring the light into my life in a in a very dark time yeah listen to dunzo you're gonna love it if you haven't listened it's you know the spirit of this podcast is um (laughs) it's the same marvel universe really right yes yes totally yeah we exist in the exact same marvel universe which i could not be happier about like you're my internet road dog we are internet road dogs and i just simply wouldn't have it any other way um not at all you, you you people know where to find me you know rate subscribe etc etc yeah thank you troy i love you so much i love you so much thank you bye Bye.